Hi, everybody, and welcome to this Talks at Google. Uh, I'm very excited uh, to be introducing two very cool guys this morning um, that I've had the pleasure of talking to in the past. Um, and I will introduce them. My name is Johnny Cranmer. I work at the Google LA office. And it's my pleasure uh, to be talking with you guys this morning. Um, so Joshua Fields Milburn and Ryan Nicodemus, better known as the minimalists, help over 20 million people live meaningful lives with less. They have a website, podcasts, best-selling books, a documentary on Netflix, which is absolutely awesome if you haven't watched it. So I encourage you to see that. And I need my notes for this one. You have also been featured on the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Forbes, Time, ABC, NBC, BBC, CBC, <laughs> NPR. Are you Minimalism. Just, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> EFG, HIJK. <laughs> yeah, yeah. KXM. <laughs> I had no idea you've uh, been in all those places. <laughs> <laughs> and now, now we have you at Google. Yeah, thanks for having us. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thanks for being here, y'all. Thank you very much. Um, so in, in true style, we want to keep this very discussional, okay. questions and answers. Uh, to the audience, we're going to reserve some time at the end where we're going to uh, invite you guys to ask them some questions live. Um, but maybe you guys should just like elaborate on the introduction. Um, tell us a little bit more about yourselves, and then we can get into some questions. Sure. Yeah, we can kind of just talk about where we where this whole thing started. You yeah, were both 35 years old now, but um, about seven years ago, eight years ago, somewhere in there, um, we were kind of living the American dream, right? Like we both grew up poor in in Dayton, Ohio. Like I, I was on food stamps and government assistance, and you know I, I thought the reason that we were so unhappy growing up was because we didn't have any money. And so when I turned 18, and I know Ryan did the same thing, I, I went out and got an entry-level corporate job. And I spent the next decade just climbing the corporate ladder. And, and by age 28, I had sort of achieved everything I ever wanted. You know, the, the six-figure salary, the luxury cars, uh, closets full of expensive clothes, and the big house in the suburbs with more toilets than people. Um, I really had all the stuff to fill every corner of my, my consumer-driven life. And, and, and then two things happened to me. Um, my mom died and my marriage ended, both in the same month. And it's kind of like getting in two car crashes at the same moment, like someone sideswipes you and then all of a sudden another car hits you because of the, uh, right at the same time. And, and, and those two events sort of forced me to look around and, and start to question what had become my life's focus. And, and I realized I was, I was so focused on success and achievement, and especially like on the accumulation of stuff. Because in our culture, quite often, that's one of the, the, the sort of trophies of success, or like how, how, many, how many things can I amass in my life? And I might have been living the American dream, but it wasn't my dream. And, and it sort of, in a weird way, sort of took getting everything I thought I wanted to realize Maybe everything I ever wanted wasn't actually what I wanted at all. And, and I started refocusing. And I, I discovered this thing called minimalism right around that time. And um, it, it was an opportunity for me to say, you know what? Some of the things in my life are probably important to me. Like, I'm not against stuff. I'm not against consumption now. But at the time, I couldn't discern really what things add value to my life and what things were just sort of in the way. What was essential? What was non-essential? Uh, did you all know that the average American household has uh, more than 300,000 items in it? 300,000. <laughs> it's, uh, it's not me going around counting people's stuff. It's uh, LA Times reported it back in, uh, in 2014. So it might be more than 300,000 now if we're, if we're continuing to amass more. But um, I, I, I look at the... Do they count every spoon? Uh, yeah, I, I, would, I guess you would count every spoon. That, that's the weird thing. When you, when you start thinking about minimalism, though, you start thinking about like, just having no things. And, and for me, that, that wasn't it. When I first discovered minimalism, I, I, I discovered a guy named Colin Wright. You saw the documentary, yeah. and he's in the documentary. Uh, it's called Minimalism. And, and he, he owns 52 items, and everything he owns fits in his backpack. And, that actually worked really well for him because he's a world traveler. Everywhere he, he, he travels to a new country every four months, everything he owns sort of fits in that backpack. And, 
you know, for him, owning a kitchen table is a liability because it won't fit in the overhead bin. But I looked at that and I'm like, you know what? I kind of like owning a kitchen table. <laughs> I kind of like having you know, a refrigerator. But, but th that didn't work for him. But then I found other minimalists as well, uh, people like Leo and Eva Babalta. And they, they live up in San Francisco. They have six kids. It's like a whole minimalist family, right? And I'm like, well, I don't want to live like Colin. I also don't want six kids. But maybe there's a comfortable middle. And, and I realized that, you know what, this thing called minimalism, th there are different flavors of it. And if I wanted to simplify my life, I would have to figure out what would work right for me. What is essential for my life? It's not like there's a list of, well, here are the 100 items you should own in your life, and then you're going to be happy. I wish we had that list, because I could just hand that to you and leave, and it'd be a lot easier, right? Uh, but the truth is that things that add value to my life may or may not add value to yours. And so I've spent the last, um, what, six, seven years now really, really uh, focused on, on the things that augment my life as opposed to the things that I'm just supposed to have because we're, we're sold this meme or this template of, of living the American dream. Yeah, yeah. That's very powerful. Um, I, I guess the first question I want to ask you is, going down that journey for both of you, how, well, let me phrase it this way, what was the easiest thing when you started adopting minimalism into your life? And then what was the most difficult thing that you encountered trying to simplify the stuff, the people, and the environment around you guys? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my whole journey began with uh, what Josh and I call a packing party, where uh, Josh first had introduced the term minimalism to me uh, months after he had kind of been simplifying his life. And he told me about what he had been doing. And I was like, that sounds like some common sense stuff. Like, oh yeah, if I don't buy a brand new car every two years, if I don't have this you know, huge three bedroom, two bathroom, 2,000 square foot home, two living rooms, like, I have no idea why I thought I would ever need two living rooms as a single guy. <laughs> but, but, you know, I, I kind of saw how minimalism made sense. Like, yeah, if I could pare down, I could reclaim my time. I, maybe I wouldn't have to work the 60, 70, sometimes 80 hours a week that I was putting in to maintain this lifestyle. So, you know, uh, I'm at lunch with Josh, and he's kind of explaining this to me. And I would look up at him, and I'm like, this sounds pretty awesome, man. Like, okay, I... I want to be a minimalist. <laughs> I'm in. Now what? <laughs> I didn't really know where to start. And I didn't want to spend several months simplifying like Josh had. That was great for him. He's always been a little bit more patient than me. Um, uh, but you know, I needed faster results. So we came up with this idea to pack all my belongings as if I were moving. And then I would unpack only the items I needed over the next 21 days to really get an idea of, of what I was uh, using and what was adding value. So Josh came over to literally help me box up everything, my clothes, kitchenware, towels, TVs, furniture. I mean, literally everything we packed up. And you can imagine, like, that first night, I unpacked um, my toothbrush and some toiletries and some clothes for work the next day, bed and bed sheets. And as time went on, I just was unpacking less and less. So after three weeks, I'm, like, standing in my second living room, uh, looking at these boxes just, like, stacked halfway to my 12-foot ceiling, that still had about like 80% of my stuff sitting in there. And that for me was like, the, that was the first kind of like huge light bulb moment for me. Like, wow, here are all these things I brought into my life to make me happy. And hardly any of it is doing its job. So I decided to donate and sell all of it. Now, there's a couple exceptions. Like I'm a snowboarder. Uh, so like, you know, held on to some winter <laughs> items, uh, held on to my snowboard. Um, that you know, maybe I hadn't used in those three weeks. But for all intents and purposes, I, I donated and, and, and sold everything. And I'll tell you, it was easy for me uh, when it came to clothes. Like you know, you go to that. I would go to that drawer, like that box that had twenty, like yard working or painting T-shirts. Like, and I'm not an artist. I mean, painting like you know, I'm painting the living room or something. And I'm like looking at myself, like wow, like here are all these shirts I've amassed over, over you know, my life, whether it was some kind of corporate event and they're handing out free t-shirts or like I'm at a uh, baseball game and I catch a t-shirt that's shot out of a cannon. Like, you know, I had all these t-shirts that I never wore, but I had them because I, you know, I wanted to hold on to them just in case. Sounds like something that we do at Google a lot. A lot of, <laughs> lot of, lot of free t-shirts given out. So, so yeah, like that was probably the easiest stuff to get rid of, but I'll tell you some stuff that I didn't realize it would be so hard. Like, um, I remember, so Josh came over after the, the three weeks, and he's kind of helping me separate these things into different piles. And I remember, like, watching him take this, like, 
box of mugs, and he's like, you know, putting it in the donation pile. And I'm like, what are you doing, man? Like, I drink coffee. Why are you getting rid of all those mugs? And he opens it up, and he's like, dude, there are like 30 coffee mugs in here. Like, how many cups of coffee can you drink? And I'm like, well, you know, I have guests over, and um, what if, you know, 25 of those break? Like, what? <laughs> I'm not going to have those backups. And uh, he pulls out a mug, and it says, like, you know, world's number one granddad on it or something. Like, I have no idea. I probably bought it for a dollar somewhere thinking that it was funny. Never used it. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. Like, I have not, I have not used that in years. I'm probably not going to use that in the next couple years. But it was just, you know, kind of uh, amazing that the coffee mugs was like the first thing that I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Can't get rid of my coffee mugs. <laughs> I drink coffee. But then certainly going into other things like sentimental items, that was really, really difficult. Um, I remember uh, I was kind of going through some stuff. Josh had left. And I came across this shoe box, and it was like all my high school, you know, like my high school memories were in this box. And I open it up, and there's like some letters that my mom had written me in high school, and uh, you know, a picture of me and like my junior prom and senior prom dates, uh, the shot glass they gave us as the um, prom gift, like nice. the high school, yeah, nice. to give to high schoolers. Yeah, I have no idea what they were thinking. <laughs> But, but I came across all these memories, and I was like, well, you're a minimalist now. Like, you can't hold on to this. you got to get rid of it. And I'm like, you know, walking the trash can, and I'm like, no, I can't. Like, I'm, I'm just I'm going to put this one off. I'm going to, like, wait. And, and uh, you know, it was like starting to bargain with myself. And eventually what I kind of did is I was like, you know, I'm going, to, I'm going to choose one thing out of this box, and I'm going to get rid of it and just see how I feel in the morning. And so I picked out a letter um, that uh, my mom had written me in high school. My... Uh, just to kind of preface it a little bit, uh, my parents got divorced when I was like seven years old. My mom had a lot of like drug and, and like alcohol problems, and um, sh she would just write me some letters that were really encouraging during high school and um, just some like you know intimate moments that, that her and I shared. And you know, at the end of the day, like I, I got picked one of those letters, and before I even read it, like I had all this like you know I started getting this emotion. Uh, this emotion was being evoked, invoked, and I read the letter. And after I got done reading the letter, it gave me a completely different feeling. It was so weird. Like, the thought of the letter gave me a different feeling than actually reading the letter. So I, like, laid it on the table. I took my camera phone and, like, took a picture of it and, like, zoomed in, make sure I could, like, still read it if I really wanted to go back and read it. And I threw it away in the trash can. I didn't even realize it was in the trash can until, like, the next night or even the night after that uh, when I went to go take out the trash. And there it was sitting on top. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that letter, like, wasn't that hard to let go of. So I did um, the same thing with a few other items in that box, like just took some pictures of it and then ended up like just tossing it. And I haven't missed it since. Um, you know, I'm sure uh, I had someone like tweet me the other day, because we were talking about this on the podcast the other day, and someone tweeted me, they were like, someone asked me for my prom photo of high school and like I threw it away, I wish I had had it. And I'm like, okay, like, <laughs> yeah. I don't think everyone should hang on to every single picture they ever have though, like it's, yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think it's, the, the weird thing is, we, the reason we have a lot of those 300,000 items or whatever it might be is it, those three words that Ryan mentioned, just in case, right? Like, we go to get rid of something, you're like, ah, you know what, I should hold on to this just in case I need it someday in some non-existent hypothetical future, right? And, and so we amass these sort of hordes, and when the first junk drawer fills up, we just we allocate a, a second junk drawer, and when that one fills up, we, we find a cabinet or cupboard or something, and we need more and more space. And, and so it, we, we don't give ourselves permission to let go of these things. And I found that I was holding on to so many things just in case, whether it was a sentimental item, and, and I didn't even have a plan to do anything with it. I, I was sort of a, a well-organized hoarder. Like, I wasn't a candidate for the, the, the TV show hoarders. There were no dead cats in my freezer or anything. <laughs> But, but I, I owned a lot of stuff, right? And so I had an, an ordinal system of bins and boxes in, in my basement. And, and uh, you know, I, I used to weigh 80 pounds more than I weigh now. And, and so I had a lot of like double XL shirts. Like that was my plan in case I, just in case I gain 80 pounds back, I'll have these out of date clothes to wear someday. <laughs> And when you say, start saying things out loud, you realize how ridiculous many of the things that, that we're holding on to are. But I, 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 don't, I just want to be clear, like, don't get me wrong, there, there are some things that had immense value to my life. In fact, it's the weird paradox of minimalism. I get far more value from the, the items that I have now than if they were watered down by hundreds of thousands of items. In fact, I think if, if you walk into my home today, you don't walk in and say, oh my God, this guy's a minimalist. You, you probably just say, 
wow, they're tidy. And, and it's because I don't, I don't own a lot of stuff, but everything I own now, it, it serves a purpose or, yeah. or it brings me joy. And yeah. Everything else is out of the way. You know, it's funny, we were, on, we were doing a live cast uh, a couple months ago, and I don't know what platform we were on, but someone... Google they, Hangouts? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's what it was, actually. Yeah, 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 Google Hangouts. Uh, yeah. it's, it's someone in the comments section, they were like, you know, it sounds like it's, you know, I don't know what the big deal is, guys. It doesn't sound like you gave up anything that was important. And Josh was like, that's exactly it. We didn't give up anything that's important. Everything we have in our lives right now, it is important. And I think that's what minimalism is really about. It's about determining what is important in one's life. And that is different for everyone. Yeah. So I, I want to dig d a bit deeper on that because it's a, fascinating, uh, it's a fascinating journey that you've gone through. And I think there's, there's two things that I'm hearing here. It's like uh, a physical let go of possessions yeah. and a decluttering. And then there's a psychological uh, benefit. But they both kind of work in tandem with each other. Um, what, so, what, what, like, how did you feel when you both went through this process? What were the what were the outcomes, and what made you want to continue doing it? Because obviously, the effects were good. Whether it was like mental, you felt better, productivity went up. Um, so, give us some of those examples of why you loved it so much. I think I think the material possessions are are a physical manifestation of what's going on inside. At least they were for me. Like, so I had all this sort of external clutter. As a re it was really a result of a lot of internal clutter. You can call it mental clutter, emotional clutter, spiritual clutter, financial clutter, whatever that internal clutter is. It, it, it's, it started with the stuff, but I also think that, that it's, minimalism isn't just about getting rid of your stuff either, right? Like I think anyone in here today, you could, tonight you just go home and rent a dumpster and throw all your crap in it and be utterly miserable. Right, like you just come home to an empty house and sulk after removing all your pacifiers, and 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 that that's because because the consumption isn't the problem. Compulsory consumption is the problem. Like I feel like I must do this. I have to accumulate more and more and more and more, and and so I, once I started dealing with what was going on outside, I was able to look inward and start dealing with what was going on inside and figuring out. You know what? It, it started for me with with the finances because. I made really good money in the corporate world. You know, a couple hundred thousand dollars in Dayton, Ohio is, um, I mean, king of the hill kind of thing, right? And, and um, uh, I know that's probably not impressive here. <laughs> <laughs> this is, Ryan, this is what it feels like to have the lowest IQ in a room, by the way. <laughs> and also, too stupid to know. <laughs> also the smallest bank account. Um, but, um, but I, uh, uh, I realized that, like, I started because of the financial thing. I made good money, but spent even, even better money. And, and so I had massive amounts of debt. Six figures worth of debt, half a million dollars if you count my, my mortgage. And, and so I'm like, you know, if I regain control of, of my expenses, then I won't have this burden on me. I won't have this huge anchor. And I won't necessarily be tethered to this career that I'm starting to figure out doesn't align with my values. But from there, I'm like, I uncovered all these other benefits, whether it was my health or my relationships. I mean, I think many of our relationships, we were talking about this when we had, had lunch uh, a couple months ago. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of our relationships, uh, especially growing up, they're, they're birthed out of uh, proximity and, and convenience. And so like we live in the same neighborhood or we work in the same office or, or uh, we went to the same high school together or whatever it may be. And there's nothing inherently wrong with those people, but, but it, it also might mean that we don't share similar values. And I, I found in my life in particular, many of, I was spending 90% of the time of my time with people who didn't share the same values as me. They were good people, they, they just didn't have the same values. And I forsook the most important relationships in my life. It's the reason my marriage ended. It's, a re it's the reason that I became distant from a lot of my other friends is because I was so focused on you know, networking and spending time with executives and stuff like that. And so, so by dealing with that, that stuff first, I was able to identify what the benefits were for me, whether it was finances or, or health or relationships or contributing to my community. And, and, and it was a more, I won't, necessarily, I won't say balanced life, but it was a more meaningful life. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you know, I think for me, like the more revelation, the, some of the more, some more of the revelation moments I had facing my hoard of stuff after that packing party, I just kind of looked at this heap of you know tens of thousands of dollars worth of stuff, and I kind of you know was forced to like think about the narrative that I was playing out in my head, and what I was telling myself was you know I make really good money in the corporate world, I'm saving for retirement. Uh, you know, I was putting away the whatever they would match, like 1% wherever we were at or something, you know. Yeah. And, uh, but then I really started to think about, like, my goal was to retire early. 
And I certainly wasn't going to do that with the money that I was taking out of the paycheck. And everything else that I had had in that room, like not everything else, but a lot of that stuff I had in the room, I put on credit cards. And I was thinking, wow, like if I actually would have saved some of this money instead of going out and trying to buy the, the latest gadget or trying to uh, you know, uh, go on the, the, the coolest vacation or going out and racking up $300, $300 bar tabs, maybe I could actually focus on what I want my priorities to be. And I think like the, the biggest thing that minimalism really helped me do is to get clear on what my priorities were and what I wanted them to be. Because for the longest time, like if you, were to, if you were to ask my you know, 25 or 26 year old self, like, hey Ryan, what are your priorities? I would have said, well, my health. If I'm not healthy, well, I'm not happy. Uh, my relationships, you know, my, my, uh, my mom, she lived a half hour away. I might have seen her six or seven times a year. Uh, my health-wise, I was eating out fast food a lot. Or I would say, oh, you know, I'm working on the big passion project that I've been putting off for two years. That's my priority. And what I realized is that I gave my priorities a lot of lip service. And what I was able to do is to actually make my priorities my actual priorities. And that's what our priorities are. It's not what we say they are. It's what we actually do with our time. Yeah, yeah. Um, before we go down that a little bit more, I think one thing that I found fascinating that came out in the documentary is that if you adopt the principles, principles sorry, of minimalism, it can... I like you, that, principalism. I was like, well, where did that it's word good. come from? <laughs> <laughs> principalism and minimalism together. Someone's registering that URL in the crowd yeah, yeah, right yeah, now. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> New title for a book, right? <laughs> Um, the, so so you, get, you get beneficial effects for you as a person and probably the people around you. But there's another ripple effect that I've felt that I noticed from the documentary, which is it's actually beneficial to the environment. Uh. It's beneficial to wider groups of people because the consumerism that we're so sucked into and that we buy and hoard, it, ha it has larger ripple effects, right? Yeah. So in essence, you're doing a good thing for yourself, but you're also having this wider effect. It, it sounds overly simplistic to say this, but for whatever reason, I didn't realize it at the time. If you consume less, you produce less waste. And, and like, it, it's, it, I mean, it wasn't like the, I, I didn't approach minimalism because I, I was like, I'm gonna save the environment. Although it was a, it was a really good benefit to realize, you know what, if I, if I consume 90% less stuff, I'm going to produce 90% less waste. It has that kind of ripple effect. And, and so figuring out that, that there are these sort of additional benefits when, once you start going down that, that rabbit hole. People at work started coming up to me and saying things like, you seem less stressed. What's going on in your life? You seem so much calmer. Why are you being so nice lately? <laughs> and because um, I never jumped up and said, look at me, I'm becoming a minimalist and, and you need to as well. Like, and even now, Ryan and I aren't proselytizing. Like, I'm not trying to convert anyone in here to minimalism. Like, they, we're just sharing something that's worked really well for us. We've seen it work really well for thousands of other people. And, and uh, we want to be able to share that and in hopes that maybe you can get a few ingredients from our recipe, tweeze those out, and, and find a way to maybe simplify a little bit if that's what you want to do. Yeah, yeah. So to bring Google into the conversation a little bit, where, so I, I know when we sat down at lunch, we talked a little bit about the digital influences we have in our lives mm -hmm. that clutter it rather than streamline it. Sure. Uh, let's put Google in that bucket, let's put Facebook, Instagram, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, where do you see Google's position in the world as you view it through minimalism? Do you think that we produce services and products that are generally good for people or do you think that in areas we clutter? Yeah, I mean, well, I don't think any, either one's mutually exclusive, right? I mean, if you look at, if you look at the tools that we have in our lives, if, if I have, well, here's a good example, because Ryan almost cut his thumb off the other day. <laughs> um, we, if you have a knife, you're cutting onions with it, and, and um, it's, a, it's a useful tool, but you can use that knife to do great harm as well. And, and so if, if I look at, at the tools that we have in our lives, whether it is Gmail, which I use, obviously use Google as, as a search engine. Um, it, it, if I look at, at those tools in our lives, like well, how, how am I using these tools? Am, am I being intentional with it? And I think there are some steps that we can, we can take to, to sort of mitigate the impulse as well. There's a, an app that I've been using on my phone called Moment. It sort of tracks how much screen time I'm, I'm spending on my phone. And the, the, the interesting thing about that, as soon as I put that app on my phone, I realize that just by the sheer fact that I'm tracking it, 
I'm using my phone differently because I know I'm sort of like being watched all of a sudden, even though it's just me watching myself in a way, and I'm trying to improve that. And so my screen time went down drastically. And I think there are other things we could do. We can remove apps we're not using uh, or apps we don't want to use. We could take temporary sort of sabbaticals. I mean, we, we have weekends for a reason, right? But but. Do we do weekends away from social media? Do, do we have a day that is sort of our, our digital Sabbath day as well? I have a, I have a good friend who, who lives in, in Los Angeles who every, every Friday night he shuts off his computer and doesn't open it back up until Sunday, until Sunday morning. And so realizing that you could set up these routines in your life. We, in fact, we were just having this conversation on the way over here. Um, about why, why did Google, you know, there were all these other search engines at one point, right? There, there was dog pile and ask Jeeves and, <laughs> yeah. and, and, and Yahoo and, and all these other places. What, what made Google really stand out? And I mean, to me, that, that was sort of the epitome of minimalism. If you, went to, if you sort of did a, a, a split screen, you went to Yahoo on one page, you went to Google on the other, and, and you saw this one, one of them was cluttered with all this additional information, and, and one was functionally this. Right? I mean, it was one line. You type something in there with, uh, uh, you know, I'm feeling lucky. And, um, and what was the other thing at the time? The advanced search thing. And that was it. I mean, that, that was minimalism brought to the web search for, for the first time in, in an elegant way. And, and, and that, what that minimalism allowed then was also to create the best search engine as well. Right? I mean, it, it, the reason everyone goes to Google now Part of it has to do with the simplicity of it, but the other part is you, you think you're going to get the best results from that experience. And so if, you're fo if by stripping everything else down, you're able to really focus on what your sort of core competency is, then, then I found that, man, th that creates a better experience, not just for the user, but for the company and everything else. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting when you put it that way, because uh, I, I would agree with you that Google probably did have a success by being very simple mm -hmm. with that home page. So that's an interesting point. Um, to the people that are here listening, what would you say to them if they're interested by minimalism uh, as a sort of like beginner's guide to start exploring how they could bring it into their lives? Well, there's a few ways to start. Um, you can have a packing party. <laughs> it might be a little unreasonable or too extreme for like a family of six or eight or something. What, what, is, the, what is the game that you guys invented? I read about this. Yeah, so this is a little bit more approachable. Uh, we have something called uh, the 30-day minimalism game. And, you know, decluttering, it can be boring sometimes. So Josh and I decided to, you know, make it fun uh, by adding a little bit of friendly competition. So you find a friend or a family member or a coworker who wants to get rid of stuff, and you both agree to play this game, and you start on the first day of the month. So, you know, July is just around the corner. Uh, you could start on July 1st. You both agree to get rid of one thing on the first day of the month. And then on the second day of the month, you get rid of two things. And then on the third day of the month, three things. And then on the fourth day, okay, so forth and so on. You probably get how it works. So it starts off really, really easy, right? Up until you get to like day 19, you get rid of 19 things. And then, you know, the next day on day 20, you're like, oh crap, I gotta get rid of 20 things today. And uh, it's funny because my partner Mariah and I, we played this um, not too long ago. And uh, even as, you know, me being one of the minimalists, we still were able to like make it through the whole month. And if you do, uh, you get rid of about 500 items. So, you know, you bet something real silly, like a, you know, maybe a dinner or something small, or, or someone has to cook dinner. Or um, so this is Google. You can bet a million. You can dollars. bet a million dollars. <laughs> so you know what? What? what, what <laughs> Raise the stakes, Nicodemus. <laughs> what Mariah did is she bet. No, this is pretty good. So Mariah was playing with a friend of hers in Fargo, North Dakota, and uh, they the loser had to basically karaoke a song. That the other per that the winner picked out, <laughs> so um, th they both ended up making it through the month. But in that case, they both won because they both had gotten rid of about 500 items. Yeah, I think I think the the other way the, th that's a very practical sort of how-to step. But the other side of of simplifying our lives is understanding the why-to side of things. Like, what, what's the purpose? And so for me, the the really important question early on was, how might your life be better with less? And I think by answering that question, you're able to identify the sort of benefits of minimalism for you. And I think they're different for everyone. You know, the, the, the benefits for, hey, we've got a four-year-old now, the benefits for a four-year-old are going to be so considerably different from the benefits for you versus anyone else in the room. For some people, it's health, it's finances, reclaiming your time, your attention. Um, and, and you have to figure out what those benefits are for you because that's going to give you really the leverage you need. I think we all instinctually know 
you know, how to declutter, right? You're not going to see me and Ryan write something like, here are the 67 ways for you to declutter your closet <laughs> this weekend. Because we all know how to do that. The question is, why are we doing it? Mm. And once you understand that, I think you have the leverage you need to move forward. Yeah. It uh, brings up a memory when I was listening to your podcast. I think the last one, mm -hmm. you had Q&A. And I, it was an eight-year-old that came up yeah. and asked you, how do, how do I apply minimalism to my life? Yeah. Which is uh, it's kind of a crazy thing to think about because, I mean, you answered it well, but like, it, it can be applied to everyone. But for a kid to ask you, it's kind of a crazy thing, yeah. right? Yeah. 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 We had a, uh, it was like a five-year-old girl at our last event in San Diego. And um, her parents were like, oh, you know, this is our five-year-old daughter. She's a big fan of your guys. It's, she came up. She's like, I donated some of my clothes yesterday. And I was just <laughs> like, God, that, I was like, she is so much further ahead than me. And, and this, <laughs> like, that is amazing that she can get into that mindset. And, you know, for her, I don't think it was about, like, not owning a lot of toys. It was the fact that, you know, her, and through her parents, like, she is... Um, getting these principles, um, especially the principle of giving, you know, I mean, giving is living. That's, you know, when I look at my values and beliefs, the like contribution is way up there. Mm. And uh, the fact that, you know, she's five years old and she can use this thing called minimalism to help her contribute more beyond herself in a meaningful way. I think it's pretty awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So a bit more of a hard hitting question, but an interesting one. Some of the folks thought this one up. Um, the idea of decluttering and getting rid of your possessions some people would call that perhaps a movement for the elite, for people that have money and can do that. Yeah. What about those that don't have anything and arguably already live a minimalist life? What, how do you respond to that? And yeah. then can the same principles be applied to their life, although they don't have as much, to make them uh, feel that they're living a more intentional life? Yeah, so, so I mean, the question's really about privilege. And, and I think it's an important question, especially in, in uh, in today's environment, because we're, we're seeing the different classes of people at, at where, where you have uh, this divide that's happening, and especially in the United States, where, where you, have, you have socioeconomic classes. And I say that word in vocal, vocal quotes, right? I grew up really poor and reali realized that, you know what, maybe, maybe we're not happy because we need more money. And so when I, when I started climbing the corporate ladder, I'm like, wait a minute, $50,000 a year isn't making me happy. I need to adjust for inflation. And so may, maybe it's, maybe it's $75,000 a year, maybe it's six figures, or maybe it's owning a bunch of stuff. Maybe that's going to make me happy. And in time, what I realized is it's, we weren't discontented when we were growing up just because of money. I mean, money will buy you certain levels of comfort and certain things that you need for sure. But beyond basic needs, uh, uh, that, that the, the correlation between happiness and money falls off with the abruptness of a cliff, right? And, and so w what I realized is that I was just starting to make the same bad decisions we made when I, before I was 18, but money enabled me to make even worse decisions, be, you know, go into debt uh, with those decisions. And so I had to be really careful. And, and, and in a weird way, I, I have a different kind of privilege. I have the privilege of seeing both sides of it, right? I had, I had the privilege of, of growing up poor and being in poverty, like true poverty, electricity being turned off in the winter kind of poverty. And, and I saw that, and I, I contrast that with what, what's going on, uh, uh, what, what went on in my 20s, where I ostensibly had it all, right, and was still discontented by that. And I think that whether I, when I was poor or when I was wealthy or when I'm somewhere in between, I find that no matter where I am on the socioeconomic spectrum, I benefit from living a more intentional life. In fact, I know now, in retrospect, looking back 30 years in the past, I would have benefited a lot, a lot more from, from being more intentional, but especially when we had fewer resources. If you don't have that many resources, you want to be very deliberate with how you re use those resources. And it's not just money, by the way. I mean, money is one resource, but it's also a renewable resource. It's your time, it's your attention. These are resources, these are things that we can't get back. And so, I mean, the one, the one thing that's been really encouraging, one of the reasons we go out on tour now, it's so we can listen to people. And we have factory workers and we have CEOs show up at the same event. Wow. And they're asking the same questions. I mean, the questions manifest differently depending on where you are on the, the socioeconomic spectrum. But they're really saying, how, I feel like my life's out of control and how do I regain control? 
of, of that life. And, and uh, because we all, at the end of the day, we want to figure out how to live a more meaningful life. You know, no matter what we're doing with our, with our time and resources, that's, that's really what we're trying to accomplish. And so minimalism is just a way for us to be more deliberate with the resources we have. I'll tell you, one of my favorite experiences on tour, uh, we went on a 100-city tour in 2014, and we were in Belfast, uh, and this gentleman came up to me. And uh, at the time, because like we weren't you know, as popular as we are now, I guess, <laughs> but we could literally just be like, hey, we're going to be at this coffee shop. Show up if you want to. And like, you know, 20 people, 30 people would show up. We didn't have to charge for tickets. I mean, now if we did that, there'd be 600 people showing up at a coffee shop and the owner would probably be mad at us for, uh, uh, you know, having a, uh, what do they call that? A, a flash a mob. Flash mob show, <laughs> minimalist flash mob show up at the coffee shop. But he comes up to me and he's like, you know, um, he's like, my name's D and I just want to tell you, man, he's like, you know, thank you so much for doing what you do. He's like, I am, I'm a fighter. And I'm like, yeah, man, me too. We're all fighting a good fight. And he's like, no, no, like I box. He's like, I'm a fighter. And I'm like, oh, wow, cool, man. And uh, you know, are, you, are you threatening me? <laughs> right? yeah. And I'm like, wow, cool. Like, you know, how is that? And he's like, I love it, man. He's like, I absolutely love it. He was like, now, I'm the guy, though. And if I could do a Belfast accent, I would totally do his part in that accent. But, uh, but I, would do it. I wouldn't do it no justice. Or can but, you do a Belfast accent? I was, I was going to jump in, but I'm not going to do it. He like, <laughs> <laughs> looked at me, and I was like, no, it's not happening. No. So, no, so uh, he's telling me about how he loves what he does, and he was saying, like, you know, now I'm the fighter that they put into the ring to get beat up on. Like, when, when there's some, like, a, uh, you know, a well-known fighter uh, that has um, an exhibition match or something, he's like, I'm the one that they put into the ring to get beat up on. He's like, but I absolutely love it. And he's like, I also, I also train other fighters, and I'm able, you know, to transfer some of my knowledge to other people. He's like, but I am dirt poor, man. He was like, I literally, some months... Um, I'll sleep on my friend's couch, and uh, you know, he's just like really telling me how he he doesn't have a lot of money, but he's like, I just want to say thank you for helping me to not feel like a loser. So you know, for all intents and purposes, like this guy is is living a starving artist life, and the fact that we can give him permission, I, I guess, is you know maybe a way to look at it for him to do what he loves without worrying about what you know his friends. Uh, uh, think about him, how much money he makes, or maybe his parents are giving him a hard time because it doesn't make a lot of money. But the fact that we can encourage him to do what he loves, I mean, that's what I really love about this. We had a girl in Adelaide who came up to us. Um, she was in line, and um, she was like, you know, it, it wasn't until I read your book, Everything That Remains, I didn't realize the bad decisions I was making with my life. She was like, you know, I've been homeless for years. She's like, but over the last three or four months, I've been able to make better decisions through this you know, inspiration that you've given me. And uh, she's like, I have a steady job now. I've been able to you know, hold a home for a few months. And you know, stories like that, to me, kind of automatically um, kind of, uh, you know, I don't want to say shuts down the argument of privilege, because I think it's something that is, it is a very important thing to talk about. But um, you know, it definitely shows how minimalism, it does really, really apply to anyone on the socioeconomic scale. Yeah. So it sounds like it can just it enables people, it gives them more focus where they need to be focusing. And when they focus in the right areas, you just get that natural energy because you're being with who you want to be with, you're doing what you want to do, and that becomes your drive and you're singly going towards that. Well, yeah, yeah, I, think the, it, I, was saying, I just think it helps people ask better questions is what I was going to say. Right. The, the, that word focus, I think, is an important one. How many of you all are busy today? Right? <laughs> so your life's out of control. <laughs> right? No, I, 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 I'm joking ha halfway, but um, I, I, I used to wear this term busy as a badge of honor, right? Hey, you, you, you want to grab coffee uh, tomorrow morning? Can, I'm so busy. Oh, uh, what's going on next week? Uh, I'd love to meet, I'm just so busy right now. And like, it was this, it, it was a catch all excuse, but it really, it, for me at least, it, it meant that man, I don't really, I don't have control of, of what's going on. And, and for me now, busy is like the worst four-letter word there is, right? Because it means that I'm not able to control my, my days. And so uh, it probably doesn't look very good on a graph. Like, I, I don't do nearly as much as I used to do. Um, but I get a lot more meaningful work done now, I feel like, because I'm not busy, I'm focused. And so, so in fact, any time when we're on the road or something, someone's like, oh, you guys sure are busy. I'm like, no, we're focused. But the only way to get there is 
I've had to get good at saying no over the last six or seven years, and I'm far from perfect, and I say yes to the wrong things all the time, but I'm much better now because I'm, I'm, I'm so much better at saying, no, I, I can't do that because here's what I'm saying yes to. It's not just no, 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 no. It's saying yes to the right things because the opposite used to be true. I'd say yes to anything that came along, and then by default I had to say no to the things that were actually important to me. Yeah, yeah. I think I remember when we had lunch, maybe both of you have this principle, but you don't have tasks in your day. Is that accurate? Yeah, I mean, for the most part, I mean, there are always sort of, I mean, I don't have like a to-do list or no anything schedule. like that. Right. We definitely have a calendar that, in right. fact, but I'll, I'll, uh, we use uh, Google Calendar. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, and in fact, we, we, one of the things, you know, you call it a productivity hack or whatever for me, but, but um, and like I said, I'm probably far less productive now uh, on the sense of just checking things off a list. But um, we share the calendar with everyone who's sort of on, on our team. And like, you'll know that, like, nope, yeah, anytime before 2 p.m. usually, like when we're at home, you, you can't book anything with me because I'm going to spend that time writing or, or uh, reading or exercising. You know, I've got a really bad back, so I've been doing physical therapy. So it's that. And, and so I find ways to, to block off large chunks of time that are meaningful, like deep work time, um, and so that, yeah, so that I'm, I'm, I'm living that best life and I can say yes to the most important things during that block. And it gives me less, uh, far fewer hours to say yes to other things, but I still have other time that I can say yes. But I, I, yeah, you're not going to see back-to-back-to-back -back -back meetings for me or anything. Yeah, yeah. It, so it, how do you guys apply that to what you're doing nowadays? Because, uh, you know, the amount of TV networks that I read out at the beginning that you've been on sure. applies to everything that you're doing today. You run a website, you have a podcast, you have a documentary on Netflix, you write books. You write essays, you have courses for people, you're here at Talks for Google, you're on a tour at the moment. I wouldn't necessarily call that minimalist, but you guys are driving it and it seems to be working for you. So how do you like how do you explain that? I mean, is it the focus that helps you drive all that stuff? Absolutely. You know, first off, I'll say when you call yourselves the minimalists, everything you do becomes steeped in irony. I mean, we don't sell a very minimalist amount of books. You should see the crowds that show up. They're not very, you know, minimalist amount of people. Um, yes, uh, we don't have a very minimalist amount of tour stops. But at the end of the day, I mean, if you were to look at the, 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 I guess, the terminus of what a minimalist or what a lot of people would think a minimalist is, it would be a monk in a monastery somewhere, in a monastery somewhere just, you know, meditating all day long, owning five possessions. Well, if we did that, we wouldn't really be able to help many people, would we? So, you know, for us, it's not about, um, it's not about having nothing. It's certainly not about deprivation. Uh, like I said earlier, every, we have a lot of important things in our lives. In fact, everything we have is important. It adds value or, you know, brings us joy or it serves a purpose. And the, 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 all the things that you listed, it's not like we started just, you know, oh, we're going to start the minimalist.com and do we got to write three books? We got to start a podcast. We got the documentary that's going to come out in 2016. Oh, by the way, we got to plan these tours and then we got to make sure we're on all these major networks. I mean, all of this has happened very organically. I mean, even with the documentary, I remember our directors up there, Matt, he, he came with us on tour in 2014 and uh, he just filmed a bunch of stuff and we had no idea what was going to become of it. We had, we had very low expectations, but we have very high standards. And what ended up happening was the, the result that you see now the, with minimalism, a documentary about the important things. But it certainly didn't start off with, we're going to have Netflix deals, we're going to be in theaters. It was just, you know, Matt, um, who is a minimalist himself, just wanted to join us to work on something that he was passionate about. And then it turned into something amazing. And that's kind of, you know, a, a short version of what Josh and I have done over the last six or seven years. Um, it's things that, what Josh said earlier, it's things that we're able to put on our plate because we keep our plate so clear of, of distractions that we're able to take on these things. Mm. And yes, over the last six or seven years, like we have had some amazing things happen and we have had a lot of things happen. But it's, you know, I kind of look at it as something we have like layered on top of each other. You know, when, I, when we first started, it was the blog and essays. And then I started getting a bunch of emails about, um, hey, can you, you know, 2,000 word emails on a regular basis. Like, hey, can you, you know, help me fix all my life problems? And I'm like, God, I wish I could like somehow, you know, help people to do this. I can't answer every 2,000 word email I get. So I started a, a little mentoring, a little coaching business. And uh, Josh was getting a lot of questions on writing. So he started a writing class. And then from there, uh, we, you know, we wrote uh, Minimalism, uh, uh, our, our first book. 
And at the end of the day, it was, again, layered on. We would, we would keep our plates clear, say yes to the things that we had uh, time for, the things that uh, we had space for. And we've continued that approach throughout. And yes, looking back, it sounds like so much, but it's, it's been very intentional. And the reason why we've been able to do so much is because we have, again, been able to say no uh, to a lot of things. So we can say yes to these very big, important things. Yeah, yeah. That's inspiring stuff to hear. Um, I think we're probably approaching some time to give the audience some questions. Cool. Great. But before we hand that over, the final question I had for you, and in somewhat you've answered it, but if you could just pinpoint one thing through the journey that you've both been through on minimalism and will continue to have, what has been the most impactful thing that minimalism has brought to your life? Yeah, I, I, think, I think for me, uh, it was actually the hardest thing to get rid of was my identity. Yeah, when you meet someone, what's the first question that they ask you? What do you do, right? And I think it's life's most dangerous question. I don't think people like have like a bad intent behind that question. Obviously, it just becomes a reg it's part of our everyday tete a tete. Like you meet someone, what do you do? And, and it's a really broad question. When you think about it. what do you mean? What do I do? I, I drink water. I go to concerts. I enjoy going to the beach and surfing. Like, what do you mean? What do I do? Oh, I mean, where do, you, where do you work? How much money do you earn so I can compare you to me on the socioeconomic ladder? Now, if we pause the question that way, we sound like a total jerk. And so instead, we just say, what do you do? And then we recite the, the title on our business card. And sometimes that's impressive. I used to have a, an impressive job title. I was director of operations for 150 retail stores, which is nice. really ironic with the whole minimalism thing. <laughs> Um, and so I managed a bunch of retail stores, and so like, I would say, here's what I do, and then I'd say, what do you do? But I found that, that you know, I was so much more than just that job title. There's nothing you know, wrong with, it, with having a job. We all have to pay the bills and, and, and find ways to do that in a way that aligns with the, the person we want to be. But at the same time, I was so much more than that. So I had to untether from what that identity was. And so when people started asking that question, what do you do, I'd say I'm really passionate about writing. I didn't say I was a writer, because then you get the accusatory questions. What have you written? Who's your publisher? Who's your agent? I was like, well, no one yet, but I really like writing. And, and so I would say I'm really passionate about writing, and then I flipped the question around. And I said, what are you passionate about? And sometimes you get the deer in headlights look, uh, because they were ready to recite that, that business card to you, and other times you it just changed the, direct, the, the, the direction of the conversation. The, the trajectory all of a sudden was like, well, I'm passionate about skiing or snowboarding, and I really like doing this. And then we would have much more meaningful conversations. I, found. I did that experiment as a year, for, for over the, the, the course of a year, and I found that I, I was able to, to really untether from, here's what I do, and here's, that, that means that's who I am as, a, as an individual. Yeah, yeah, it's powerful. Yeah. For me, it's uh, freedom. Like, I, I truly feel free. And what I mean by that is I just became debt-free for the first time like a couple years ago. Congratulations. Thanks. Thank you very much. I mean, that is, to me, that's a new American dream, is having zero debt. Because we have so much freedom in this country. I mean, an 18-year-old can graduate high school and sign up for six figures worth of student loans. I mean, it just blows my mind, the freedom that we have. And I'm totally ripping this off from Spider-Man. But with that freedom... <laughs> comes great responsibility. <laughs> and we have to make decisions uh, with, you know, with all the rope that is given to us. So now, you know, th this whole thing started with, I just wanted to pay off some debt. I wanted to get rid of uh, you know, my fancy car I had, get rid of that debt payment. I wanted to get rid of my home, that, that debt payment I had there. I just wanted to have a life to where I could be a barista and you know, live off of 25, 30,000 bucks a year. If everything right now, if the rug was like slipped out from underneath of us, internet blew up, we couldn't sell books online, or uh, you know, we couldn't tour anymore, and you know, there, wh whatever, like let's just say everything at the fan, I could, still, I could turn my life around on a dime right now. I'd have to move apartments, so like my, my rent's a little high for someone who makes 30,000 bucks a year, 25,000 bucks a year, um, but I have no lease, and I could do that in a second. And that, to me, that is true freedom. And that is why I think minimalism is so important for many people. It kind of helps them to, to, I guess, put a template together on what looks free for them and then work towards that. Mm. Powerful, very powerful. Um, so we'll turn it back to the audience if anyone has any questions. I think that we have to use this. OK. You want me to do that? Yeah. Can I throw I think, it? I think we th tap it and throw it. I think it's you got to tap it? I, th I think so. Did I do it right? Is that how we... All right. Yeah? Nice. Hey. 
Hey. Okay. One, one, two, one, two. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so first I have to get one, one protest out of the way. I think it should be fine to have one box with letters that you got from your mother. There's something about the paper, and it wouldn't make you less of a minimalist, just kind of a, a thought there. Thanks, man. Well, What's your name, brother? Uh, Ron. Nice to meet you, Ron. Same here. Um, here's my question, and again, this is kind of like the privileged question. It's kind of a, a question about the bigger picture, as it sure. were. There are, um, I'd say, two forces kind of going on in, in like competing each other. Uh, on one hand, there are people like you and other well-meaning people who are giving people the option, hey, you get off this treadmill and, or, or this what, whatever it is that, that you're on and, and, and make your priorities what really works for you. Yeah. Okay? And that is wonderful. And it's, I'm very happy that you're getting to thousands of people and making the changes, maybe tens of thousands of people. On the other hand, there is way, way, way more budget going to telling people, if you, uh, you, know, if you buy my crap, then you will be loved, sure. right? Or you'll get mm -hmm. laid, or whatever it is that. Yeah, the, we've the commodified love. <laughs> I'm sorry. We've commodified love. Right. Exactly. And um, so you may become successful in the sense that you would get to a lot of people. That, but it'll be a very niche success. Sure. Right? Yeah. Um, and what what can we do about this? bigger picture because, like I said, right now if you're on NBC, still way more of the time of their programming is for that other message. And yeah, it's nice they kind of, you know, paid their dues and let you talk there too, but, you know, it's... Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Big well, picture. I, I, think, I think that um, what we're doing is, is by nature subversive to what you're talking about, the culture that you're talking about. And I would say we're doing it right now by, by helping to you know, share this, this idea, to share this philosophy. Um, yeah, it's, it is a very tough, it's a tough racket because, you know, the, it, it is a lot of forces that are working against us. But, and of course, this is like a very biased uh, opinion because for the last seven years, I've been, you know, talking about minimalism. But what I, what I see, though, is that five-year-old, high school kids, college kids, um, and it's not just that, that demographic. I mean, it's you know, great grandmothers who will bring three generations of, of uh, daughters with them to our events. But what I am seeing is you know, people are starting to realize that what they're trying to be sold isn't necessarily the answer to happiness. And it doesn't take people uh, earning six figures to figure that out. Um, uh, you're, you're wincing, why are you wincing? No, no, it's just because, you know, in the end, I think what most people do, it's like the, 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 biggest, the biggest effect there. It's like the, the total sum of all the memes that go through their brain from, you know, from one year to... And, yeah, and yeah. yes, people can kind of... Some people can take out their own thing and kind of decide what to... But sure. I think in the end, this is, uh, you know, with, with, without, without fighting against the problem, you, uh, you, you're, you're fighting it by... But in a positive year, you're, you're offering an alternative, yeah, yeah. and you're hoping that as many people as possible will, you know, forgo the bad option and take that. Yeah. But I, I'm I'm a little skeptical that be, while this other option is so powerful and it kind of goes at you from more and more avenues and in so yeah. many different ways, I, I don't think that there's a it's really it's really realistic to assume that, you know, that you're going to get there one grandma at a time. You know? Yeah. The, the uh, average American sees five thousand bits of input a day. Why are you giving this back to me? Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, so, so uh, just, yeah, just real quick. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, like, the average American sees, sees 5,000, not bits of input, I'm sorry, 5,000 advertisements a day. 5,000 advertisements a day when, when you're on uh, whatever, whatever uh, TV, um, billboards, whatever social media you go to. Like, there are Google Plus. Yes, Google Plus. <laughs> Served to you by Google. <laughs> Which I'll say is by far, like, the most, I feel like, is the least uh, uh, intrusive. Yeah, right? Right. Yeah. No. It's, yeah, it's, exactly. it, it, it is the least intrusive by far. And I'm not just saying that because I'm here at Google. Um, but, but so no, like, like kudos to that because it is amazing like how it is. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. right. <laughs> so, so, but, but my, my point is, is that we, people do, the grandma, they do need a way to filter through those 5,000 advertisements a day. Because when we see something on a billboard, then in a commercial, then, uh, you know, whatever, that will seep into our subconscious. And we do start to think like, oh, you know, man, if I got my partner that really nice luxury car 
and put a big bow on it and surprised her for Christmas, like that's going to make me happy. Or if I go on that, you know, vacation, yeah, it's, it's going ma- to make me really, really happy. Or yeah, if I go to Jared or, you know, whatever, if I get that big diamond ring, like, man, she's going to be so happy. Like we are told what is going to make us happy, which is really interesting because like post-industrial age, advertisements actually fulfilled needs. And now we create the need. And I, I think that what we're doing is, yes, yes, it's helping one person at a time. I'm certainly not going to get into the political realm. I think maybe that where you, is where you might be going with it. But I think, but I, I, I guess what I'm getting at, though, is that uh, even if it was just one person, even if it was just that, if you, even if it was just D who came up to me and said, dude, thank you so much for helping me not feel like a loser for being poor, that would make it all worth it. And uh, we are reaching millions of people. Um, if you have any other, you know, grand, big ideas, I'm totally open. Um, but... What I focus on is what I think is, is right and what I think is adding you know, the most value to, to the people out there, and that's, that's really what I focus on. Yeah, real quick, I, I'm not trying to change the world. Uh, I'm just trying to help a little bit. Mm. And I think companies like this have the opportunity to change the world. And, and so I, I would put it back on you. And if each one of you finds a way, if you're interested in helping, you know, but I don't think it comes down to you know, regulating how many items someone can own. Like telling someone what they can and can't have is, is not gonna be the answer. The answer is going to be for us to find ways to help out a little bit. And so if we can help out a little bit, some other people can help out, you all can help out. You can you can create some great change. Yeah, I don't you know I don't want to put a dent in the universe as Steve Jobs once said. I just want to want to show up and help a little bit. Yeah. All right. <laughs> um, you guys, thank you so much. This is incredibly profound. Like, this what's is, your name, brother? Uh, Conrad. Nice it's to meet Conrad. you. Um, literally the the realest, most subversive shit I've heard in a while. So thank you. Thank um, you. <laughs> so uh, five years ago, I committed Facebook suicide. <laughs> Pulled the plug. Nice. Gave people 48 hours. I'm like, hit me up IRL, as the kids say. <laughs> um, and Congrats, by the way. That it is was awesome. F- fantastic. It was liberating. Um, the reaction from a pretty big subset, of, a pretty big set of people was swift and fierce. People felt judged. It, they came back at me hard. Mm. Um, I'm curious to know, because I'm, I'd like to take this even further. Did you guys, I mean, you talked about your past and making some choices about people who weren't value aligned. Did you get that same reaction? How did you process that and redirect it? I'm curious to know how you felt and how you moved through that because I got to believe that you experienced some of the same stuff. For sure. Yeah, I'd, uh, so, so I think there are three types of relationships in our lives. We have sort of our primary relationships. It's your, uh, the five people uh, that, that are closest to you, 10 people if you're Catholic. Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, then you have like, your secondary relationships, people you still really care about, love, you know, extended family, coworkers, whatever. And you have the, 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 the third tier, the periphery. And, and uh, those are people that you know, are still in your life and, and you care about them. But I found I was spending so much time with that periphery, I was spending time with the wrong people. And because of that, those inner two layers, especially the people closest to me, um, they, and they pretended they understood too, right? Because like, oh, you're out there being successful and you're working 80 hours a week, you know, go ahead and do that. But the truth is it didn't feel good. It didn't feel successful. And so I had to reprioritize a lot of my relationships. And in doing that, I, I had to cut out some of the relationships in my life. And, and sometimes, sometimes we have to let go of shitty relationships in our lives too because it, when, when I look at, at some of the, the people in my life before, um, a lot of people would play the victim role, and victims become victimizers pretty quickly. And I realized that I could try to repair some relationships, but there were some that were not worth repairing uh, because I wanted to surround myself with people who would help me be the ideal version of myself as opposed to you know, dragging me back down to a, a less ideal version. Yeah, uh, when we called ourselves the minimalists, we found out really quickly who our friends were. Um, it, was, uh, it, it, was, it was shocking. Um, looking back, I'm really glad that it happened that way because a lot of the people who like instantly started judging and I started seeing some of that backlash, um, I automatically knew who, was, who were actually my friends and who weren't. And it took a, you know, a lot of tough conversations, um, even with family members. Like my mom called me up, uh, you know, hey son, how you doing? I'm like, I'm great, how are you? I'm doing all right. She's like, what's this minimalist crap? And I was like, oh, you found the website. Like, she must have been Googling my name or something and, like, had come across it. And uh, I'm like, yeah, what do you think? She's like, I don't really get it. Like, are you depressed? <laughs> um, are, are you not going to be around for holidays anymore? Can I, 
you know, can I not uh, buy you gifts anymore? And I'm like, well, mom, uh, yes, I am depressed and I'm trying to get out of it. And I am using this as a way to uh, kind of get out of this slump that I really feel like I've been in for the last several years. And I said, no, I, I will absolutely be around for holidays. Like, I, in fact, I hope to see you more than just the holidays, because that's about, like I said earlier, I only saw her a few times a year. It was major holidays, maybe Mother's Day, her birthday. And you know, I, I really want to spend more time having a relationship with you rather than focusing on, on my work. And you know, when it comes to gifts, I'm like, yeah, you know, uh, I, I'd rather you not buy me anything. Like, I appreciate the sentiment that you have, um, but if it's something that I don't need, if it's not going to serve a purpose, or you know, if it's not something that's going to make me super happy, like, don't worry about spending fifteen dollars on a on a, a you know necktie clip or something. And she's like, well, I'm your mother, and I'm still going to buy you things anyway. <laughs> I'm like, okay. I guess, like, you know, as my mom, she has that, that right to say that. Um, and I'm like, Mom, I just got to be honest with you. If you get me something and I don't use it, like, I'm going to have to find another home for it. I'm going to have to donate it. I'm going to have to give it away. This is not the thing to say to your mother, by the way. <laughs> um, she kind of reacted. Uh, she was a little angry, rightfully so. And, we, and it kind of got a little heated. But it got to a point where uh, I just kind of slowed things down. I'm like, Mom, let me just... Let me just you know, stop you for a second. I love you so much. You love me, right? She's like, yeah, of course I love you. And I'm like, I want you to be happy. You want me to be happy too, right? She's like, yeah, of course I want you to be happy. And I said, well, if, if that's the case, then what I need from you is support. I don't need you to have a packing party. I'm not gonna come to your home and judge all the stuff that you have. All I need is for you to support me on this, on this journey that I'm, that I'm starting. And that is what really got through to her. And I, I mimicked that conversation with a lot of people. And what I had to realize, too, is the people who were doing the judging, I got rid of my Facebook a few months ago, and uh, it is, I cannot tell you how freeing it is. Oh, it's my amazing, God. Right? It's, it's so great. It's, it's unbelievable. Hey, Josh, how do you know someone got rid of their Facebook? Don't worry. They'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I got a little bit of the backlash, too, on that. And, and I just had to remind myself, like, anytime someone is judging me, judgment is but a mirror that reflects the person's insecurities that's doing the judging. And that is ultimately what it comes down to. Uh, people who are my true friends, people who actually do love me, they're not going to feel judged. They might have a conversation with me, they might ask me some questions, but they're not going to give me that backlash. backlash. People who love me and want me to be happy, they will support me. And what I'll say is doing something like getting rid of Facebook or doing something like you know, calling yourself a minimalist and, and, and or call it simplicity. You can call it whatever you want. We're the minimalists because the domain was available for like eight bucks. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I mean, call it whatever you want. But I think doing something like that, it is a good way to actually see who your true friends are, not just who your friends are on Facebook. Yeah. We have time for one more. I think so hey, one, thank more you very much, man. one more question. One more question. One more. Oh, Cleo, hi. Let me see if this is working. Okay, hi. Got it. Hello. Um, well, I just wanted to first point out that um, while everyone thinks of Google as a search company, we're actually an advertising company. I mean, mm -hmm. that's really where we make our money. So it's kind of funny for you guys to like say, like, you know, we're forced into this consumeristic society by ads. Like they're forcing you to um, feel like you need something or feel like you want something. Mm -hmm. And we're part of that. I mean, mm -hmm. unfortunately, our company is part of the problem. And that's an unfortunate thing to say. But I don't work in ads anymore, so whatever. Yeah. <laughs> 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 right in there. Um, but what I was going to ask was actually when, um, when you guys began your journey and you were leaving these positions at your old companies where you were making six-figure incomes and you were like, hey, I'm going to go do this other thing. How many people reacted to that like you guys are crazy? I mean, I have to feel like it was a lot, right? I mean, you were talking about your Facebook friends and how many of them didn't understand and that's how you really separate the wheat from the chaff, right? Yeah, they, they didn't believe me because my, my initial plan before the whole minimalist thing took off was I left and just wanted to be a barista and write fiction full time. That was, that was my gig. I, it was a coffee shop two blocks from my, ha my apartment that I was, I moved into this small apartment and uh, uh, was on the, the, the way to becoming debt free. And 
then like the whole minimalism thing was this beautiful accident because Ryan came to me and he's like, hey man, you've been writing fiction for a long time. Do, do you think that you could write some nonfiction about sort of this journey and we could share it? And, and that's where the minimalists.com started was, was sort of with that, that journey. And uh, when I told people I was just gonna go write full time, they, they looked at me and said, you can't do that. If, if you could just go do that, everyone would do it. And I'm like, you realize there are some people that make a living from writing, right? Like, I, this, this wouldn't be the first time in human history <laughs> that, that someone became a writer. Um, and, and it was also because they didn't understand, like, I, I, didn't, I didn't say, well, I'm going to make the same amount of money. I'm like, no, I can live off of that, that year, first year I left, I made $23,000 a year. It was like 90% less uh, uh, money. But strangely, I actually contributed more that year. Uh, in terms of charity and time and stuff like that, than I ever than I had at all in the corporate world. And so yeah, people. They, they, and it's not that they were just um, confused by it; they didn't believe me at first. But like Ryan said, you start to figure out who your real friends are and, and who people who just want to associate with you because you had a particular job title are. Yeah. I would say it is really cool though to see Google, and, and I was talking to Johnny about this before we started this panel. Like I feel like if every corporation just did a little bit of what Google does as far as they do put people first in a lot of ways. And you know, I am like, I am not anti-capitalist by any stretch, but I think that the inherent, uh, the inherent problem with capitalism is money first. It is bottom line first, and maybe it's people second. Um, that is, that's a problem. And to see a company like Google flipping that a little bit, like I think that does provide an example for other corporations to do that. You're right, I mean, corporations, they are inherently dangerous, for sure, uh, because they do contribute to the problem, but it would be nice to see other corporations kind of putting people first before, before that bottom line. Like, some of the programs you guys have are amazing. Like, what you do with the profits, like the, um, what is it called, the? Project Loon. Yeah, Project yeah. Loon, like, that is such a cool thing, or the uh, airdrop thing you were telling me about. Yeah, yeah, the drones, um, yeah. Yeah, the drones, um, dropping supplies and things that other third world countries need. Like, that's amazing. I can only imagine if every company, like, put that into their, uh, you know, to their, uh, to their work atmosphere. And, There's nothing inherently wrong with, with money. No. You know, Ryan and I aren't allergic to money. Um, and and the, the question is, well, what do we do with, with that money? So yeah, I no longer, money is no longer the primary driver for doing what I do. But it, whenever you're making a business decision, it still has to be part of it, right? I can't go on tour and perpetually lose money forever, right? It, that, that's just a, just a bad business decision. So then the question is, how can I do this so that it does align with my values and also make some money on it? And then can I do some really cool stuff with that money? So Ryan and I have built orphanages. We funded high schools. We've contributed to, to terrorist victims, things like that, where we, we, we couldn't have done that without money. And so you know, money allows you to buy you know, a Ferrari or it allows you to do something really cool to contribute to the world beyond you in a meaningful way. That reminds me, this month is Google Serve. So if you haven't signed up for a project yet, <laughs> Google lets you have 20 hours um, of, your, of your work time to go volunteer for wow. you know, building houses for the Habitat for Humanity and beach Love cleanup that. and all this stuff. We're doing that in June. That's killer. So that if is you haven't cool. volunteered yet, you should try to sign up for something this month. Is that what the volunteer shirts are? Yeah. OK, very cool. Beautiful. Awesome. Thank you for that. See, that's a meaningful t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, thank you so much. I know that we've come to time, so a round of applause. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thanks very much, Ben. I'm going to get a hug, brother. Yeah. <laughs>